us then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because we have we have uh, SOC group uh, uh, communication, the multimedia, and also control and uh, uh, robotics group, three groups. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's about. Not, uh, it's not too technical. Uh, a little bit. Uh, I go a little bit uh, into technical details, but not. Uh, yeah. Not too heavy, so it should be yeah. fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. No problem. I think uh, uh, it's about time. So uh, because we, uh, I think we better uh, start uh, on time. So otherwise, it will be too late for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are you, uh, are you recording? Uh, can you record this? Uh, yes, it is recording, right? Yeah, yeah, I see. It's yes. saying here it's already yes. recording. Yes. yes, yes. If I can have later the recording, it would be nice also. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, good morning, uh, Rodrigo, uh, check in the students. Uh, today we have the uh privilege to have uh Ro professor rodrigo uh, from brazil to give a a talk uh let me briefly uh introduce uh, professor rodrigo uh, to you uh rodrigo is an associate professor at furg in rio grande brazil where he teaches and uh, researches in the field of robotics and the artificial intelligence he has a BS degree in control and automation engineering, engineering and a MS degree in computer vision and a PhD in robotics from Osaka University, Japan, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at UFRGS. He has extensive international experience, including seven years in Japan and one year here at NTNU. He is a co-founder of Kiran Robotics an innovative startup focused on social robotics. Rodrigo coordinates and participates in projects involving social, terrestrial, aerial, and uh, underwater robotics, and the least uh, TRIA, a specialized course in robotics and AI that connects Brazil, Uruguay, and uh, Argentina. Through intelligent robotics, he solved real-world problems and also study Cognition, uh, seeking to understand what makes us human, while also raising ethnic questions about the uh, advancement of this technology. So, uh, then, uh, please join me uh, in welcome Professor, Professor Rodrigo to give his speech. Okay. Now uh, I have to uh, transfer. Down. Oh, here. Okay. So I, uh, Rodrigo. Now I, now I have transferred the the control to you, so you can uh, project your slides. Oh, okay. I see. So let's see if I can do this. Okay. Yeah. Webex always makes me a little bit nervous because uh, everything disappears <laughs> when I start sharing the slides. <laughs> Um, okay, I will do this in this screen. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Taiwan. Uh, I was there uh, for one year um, and uh, I forgot all my Chinese. <laughs> but um, uh, I'll try to speak slowly and uh, Please ask questions if you uh, if you don't understand anything or if you have comments, you can ask questions uh, at any time. Okay, uh, this talk should take uh, about uh, until uh, um, twelve in Taiwan time, I think. Yeah, about one a.m. here, and um, yeah, but I can stretch or go quickly, a quick, a little bit quicker if if, uh, if we need. Okay, uh, you can see my Instagram handle uh, below my photo, uh, Tio Guerra. So you can follow me if you want um, uh, by following this uh, handle, this uh, nickname. Okay, T I O G U E R R A. Okay, so today's talk 
In today's talk, I'll, I'll, I want to talk a little bit about large language models and maybe a little bit about uh, multimodal uh, models uh, like uh, vision language models. And because this is a very exciting subject to me and uh, I see many opportunities in robotics, but also I think uh, even if you're not in robotics, you will see that uh, this type of technology has applications in other domains. Uh, basically, anything that involves uh, some kind of planning and um, uh, more high level decision making um, can be uh, somehow uh, 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 addressed by this type of technology. Yeah. Um, yeah, so many opportunities. So just before we go on, uh, where I, I am talking from, so now I am at Universidade Federal do Rio Grande, uh, F-U-R-G, FURC, we call. This is one uh, uh, federal university, so university by the government of Brazil. Yeah, we have, I think you can see my, my cursor, right? We have four campuses in our university, about um, almost a thousand staff, uh, more than 800 of these staff with uh, PhD, so uh, professors like me, uh, associate professors or full professors, and uh, about 9,000 students in 76 undergrad courses and uh, two, almost two, two and a half thousand students in uh, 16 graduate courses. So you are in a graduate course. We do not have electrical engineering graduate course uh, in this university, but we have computer engineering. Uh, a very, very um, old, uh, um, very traditional course on computer engineering here in Brazil. Uh, it was the first one, yeah. And uh, we are very proud of that. And um, inside this university, um, I am uh, at this, what we call the Centro de Ciencias Computacionais. This is the com computer science uh, center, let's say. Uh, where we have 41 uh, uh, professors and, and uh, other staff, yeah, uh, associate professors, adjunct professors, and uh, three undergrad courses. Uh, so we have computer engineering with about uh, a little bit more than 200 students, automation engineering. Uh, I am graduated as an automation engineer, a control and automation engineer, so 177 students uh, in this uh, course. In information systems, about uh, 160 something students. This changed over time, but more or less. Yeah. And we have a master program in computer engineering, uh, which uh, I'll become part of uh, hopefully this year. And also uh, distance specialization on robotics and artificial intelligence that I'm very proud to be one of the co-founders and also um, the, uh, I coordinate this course in the Brazil side because this is a three country uh, course. This has Uruguay, Argentina, and Brazil together. And this all distance learning. So if you want to know more, maybe you can even find some collaboration here. We can talk more about this later. Yeah, because I always want to do collaboration with you guys. <laughs> and uh, also we have a, a kind of um, industry university partnership program where we have many, many projects with um, companies all over Brazil and sometimes uh, even companies from abroad. For example, I coordinate now a project with uh, Stil. Stil is a group from Germany uh, where they have uh, robot uh, lawn mowers. They mow the lawn, uh, they, they cut the grass, yeah. Uh, we are doing something else uh, beyond cutting the grass so trying to do that. I also have another project with uh, Brazilian government um, for uh, the military application of drones for uh, localization without GPS. Uh, usually I avoid military projects, but this one uh, really touch um, on a very in interesting subject that is uh, for a country. Uh, I, I see ta Taiwan also has many issues. Brazil, although Brazil is very big, uh, we have we de 
depend too much on other countries, for example, for GPS, uh, we, we do not control the satellites. So if another country wants to uh, shut down the, the satellites, we are uh, hopeless. Yeah. So we are designing a kind of system to localize, uh, to locate uh, aircraft by looking at uh, images from the ground and looking to satellite images and so on. Uh, this is another project I have. And we have many more, yeah, on robotics and mobile robots and so on. So, if you are interested in collaboration, please uh, talk, talk to Professor Chu or, or, or also uh, Jackie, uh, that's a, a dear friend. And uh, I'm sure we can find a way to do some exchange or uh, work together. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead to the talk now. Um, I start this talk uh, going back. Uh, make some analogy for you to try to understand uh, my opinion about uh, all this debate we see now about uh, artificial intelligence uh, taking may maybe taking over the world, becoming super intelligent or something like that. And uh, some people really shrug. They do like this. Yeah, this is nothing. Uh, why do, do do people care? Some other people take this very seriously. Yeah. And uh, I take this analogy about the uh, the invention of flying. Okay, if you look back uh, in the early 1900s, uh, so about a hundred years ago, um, when we we were researching uh, how to fly, we didn't know how to do that. So we look at uh, the wings of birds. We look at the at the the uh, what they call the now I, I forgot the name yeah the plumes of the, the birds uh, so we we try to make them flap maybe flap wings maybe they have to I, I, we didn't know what to do right so we are trying to make um, wings that um, that could fly but we didn't know how this worked. Oh, wait. Yeah, okay. So Webex was asking me to install something, but I, I refused. So uh, anyway, so this, um, this was because we did, we did not have any idea how to fly. So we, we only had uh, balloons that were uh, lighter than air because they have hot air inside. And this is lighter than normal air, so they they fly in a different um, way, yeah. But something that's heavier to make it fly, we didn't know how to do that. So we had many ideas. What is flying? What means to to say something is flying? Yeah. And there is still some debate, yeah, because the first uh, the the invention of the airplane, maybe almost everywhere in the world, maybe you heard about uh, the Wright brothers, right? Uh, most people talk that uh, they, they say that the Wright brothers invented the airplane. But in Brazil, we say that uh, Dumont, Santos Dumont invented the airplane because he was a Brazilian. <laughs> but not only because he was the, Brazil, the Brazilian guy, he was actually a, a little bit French because he, has, he had a French family. Um, but back then, 100 years ago, many people were trying to make the airplane. And uh, Santos Dumont was the first who made an airplane that could take off by itself. And uh, the Wright brothers, they did this a little bit earlier, but they did not, the, their airplane did not take off by itself. It had to had some kind of catapult, uh, some kind of uh, uh, propulsion to take off. And then it could sustain flight, but could not take off by itself. Yeah. So even today, people discuss what's flying. So if you take off by yourself, if you don't take off by yourself, is it flying still or not? <laughs> and so on. But no matter what people argue about, if they love their heroes uh, of their own country or not, uh, or, or discuss these little details, somehow we managed to make machines like this one. Can you see that? So this is a huge airplane, not a very different from the one I took to go to Taiwan last time I visit. And uh, this is very large. Yeah, these airplanes they can carry uh, maybe uh, several hundred people, uh, many tons. Uh, they are made of metal, 
they fly near the stratosphere and uh, we, we, we sit in coach and we watch a movie while we fly around the world for hours and hours, something that no, no bird ever imagined. I mean, there's no bird on the face of earth, uh, no animal ever uh, flew uh, such a heavy load for such a large uh, flight uh, uninterrupted, yeah? So this is a fantastic achievement, but still we may say, is this flying really? Because if I look at an eagle, this uh, morning I was looking at my window, you cannot see, but I have a window here and an eagle, a kind of eagle from Brazil uh, landed in the air conditioning over there. <laughs> it was very, it was looking at me and then it flew away. So if you look at an eagle, it can fly and dive and maybe even go underwater and fish or grasp an animal and troll and do things that no airplane can do. Maybe, maybe sooner um, uh, than later we'll find uh, drones or other things that can do something similar. But uh, so far, so far, no airplane can do this. Uh, no airplane can clap wings. And then if we say flying is clapping wings, then we can say, okay, maybe this is not flying. But this discussion is really helping or not. <laughs> Maybe it's helping a little bit to understand what uh, uh, what kinds of types of flying are there. But for the engineering side, maybe it's interesting to understand the, the airplane, understand aerodynamics, and then improve and improve it to make it useful. Yeah. And this is the analog analogy I, I make to thinking. So the LLM, the large language models, uh, they, they generate this kind of discussion of, okay, this is not really thinking, this is not real intelligence. Because look at the cat, so Jan LeCun is one of the godfathers of uh, AI, and he says, look at a cat, how a cat is very, um, uh, a cat can jump and, and, and always falls uh, uh, with the, the paws uh, to the ground. It's, uh, it's very uh, uh, acrobatic, yeah? Uh, and and uh, uh, no robot can do it. Uh, maybe some Boston Dynamics robot is very good, but uh, not as good as a cat, maybe not yet at least. And um, uh, maybe we see many kinds of intelligence that uh, other animals and humans have that these machines, they, they are hopeless, yeah? If you ask one of these machines to count words, they, they, they somehow, um, make terrible mistakes and uh, but although they are very bad on certain things they are very intelligent and uh, maybe not intelligent as the humans um, in some ways but in some in some narrow uh, in some applications they are uh, for sure very very um, capable and in a way that nobody really uh, predicted before and this is very interesting Interesting, not for the debate of evil machines or something like that, but interest, it's interesting to explore what kind of applications we can have with these, uh, these capabilities, yeah? So, uh, I'd want to discuss here, is this real intelligence? Is it conscious? But it's a kind of intelligence, like the airplane does some kind of flying, yeah? And uh, like the airplane, maybe this kind of intelligence is very powerful maybe more powerful than we can imagine right now because the first airplane was very uh, simple, maybe it could fly one, one person, uh, but now we can, it can fly to the stratosphere very, very high, very fast and carry uh, hundreds of people. So this intelligence quickly can surpass uh, human capabilities in some narrow fields, in some narrow uh, cognition, uh, applications, yeah? And this uh, has many applications for systems engineering, for uh, ro robots and other uh, embedded machines that uh, have uh, impact in the real world, yeah? So this is what is the, the subject, more or less, of this talk. So, uh, and uh, with not much uh, further uh, uh, delay, I show here the famous, uh, diagram of a transformer model, yeah? Uh, 
Does any of you have ever seen this uh, diagram? Uh, have you um, maybe studied transformers before? Uh, I, I just wanted to, to check. Maybe some of you. Actually, I don't even know how to see your hands if you're raising the hands or not. Anyway, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully some of you have studied transformers. Yeah, Jackie. Yeah, I, I was hoping you <laughs> you raise your hand. And uh, uh, maybe some of you studied neural networks. Okay, maybe you didn't study transformers yet. It's not too late. Uh, transformers are very, uh, very um, uh, young. Uh, they were introduced uh, end of 2017, but it was not too famous until a few years ago when they started performing better and better. Originally, they were invented for translation. So applications like Google Translate. So how they work is that, and I'll show in a moment, but uh, I just want to stay in this slide a little bit. Um, uh, the original transformer has two sides. Okay, the left side is called the encoder, and the right side is called the decoder. Okay, and they are very similar to each other, but they are connected somehow uh, in the middle here. And some of the transformers you, we use today, they only have the the right side. Okay, and this is called the decoder only transformer. Uh, I know, I think uh, ChatGPT 3.5 was a decoder only transformer, for example. And uh, some other uh, models have only the left side. Uh, these are not for the left side cannot generate text. They can only classify, for example, uh, for some type of sentiment analysis or emotion analysis or to infer intention in some uh, speech. Maybe a kind of classification. Uh, maybe I have a bank and I want to know if the person wants to withdraw money or wants to borrow money or whatever. Then I have some options and I want to classify based on the text the person is typing or something like that. And this uh, is called a BERT. So the BERT model is a transformer with only the left side, only the, the encoder. Yeah. And uh, sometimes we only have the right side, like a ChatGPT 3.5, and sometimes we have both sides. Yeah. And um, this uh, works by, I, I'll show in a minute, but uh, uh, just uh, uh, for us to understand the dynamics, uh, how this works is that we have a kind of what we call the context window, and then we input something in the uh, encoder side. And it comes at all at once. So we have uh, maybe some text and it comes uh, at once to this uh, encoding side. And it goes through some layers. And then somehow this will uh, uh, get some abstract idea of the meaning of these words, let's say. Yeah, for now, let's say that. And this becomes the context, what you call the context. So this could be. Uh, in the translation application, this may be, I, I input some uh, uh, text in Chinese here, and then I want to translate in the right side, I want to translate into uh, English, for example. Yeah. And the Chinese text is all done, and then I input here at once. On the right side is a little bit different. What happens in the right side is that we input only one word, Actually, we call it a token. I can talk a little bit about what is a token later, but we input only one word, initial word, a special kind of uh, word that marks the start of sentence. And then it goes to the layers, not very different from here, and then select the next word. And then the next word is concatenated, and we have now two words. And then with the two words, I go to the process again and get the third word. And now with three words, I repeat the process and so on and so forth like this. Yeah. So the decoder, it works in a loop, generating one word after another, one token after another. 
This is why when you talk with ChatGPT or when you talk with Cloud.ai or when you talk with Gemini, you see it's like it's typing, yeah? That's not just effect. That's actually the transformer generating the text little by little because it goes through the decoding process in the, in the left side. And somehow, yeah, if it has a context from the, from the, sorry, the decoding process in the right side. So if it has the context from the left side, it can somehow uh, translate, yeah. But can do much. No, that can do much more than that, yeah. So let's let's look at this um, machine and see if we find some kind of magic inside. What's so magic about it, yeah? And uh, it's interesting enough. Uh, there's no magic actually. Uh, well, first of all, uh, just. Uh, uh, looking at the function, what it, what it is doing is a, a kind of classification. Yeah, is it's trying to guess the next word. It's trying to guess the next word in a vocabulary, and this vocab this vocabulary can be very large, like maybe a million different tokens, and we we have to choose the best next one based on what we had before. This is what's trying to do. Yeah. Um, of course, um, it's much more than that. Uh, and now, if you look at it, uh, people uh, are amazed uh, uh, on how the LLMs can somehow uh, make arguments, uh, develop some kind of uh, thought process, and uh, try to organize ideas and so on, just by uh, by trying to predict the next word. Yeah, how come? And uh, but let's look at uh, the machine itself, yeah? So at first, uh, we have something that's uh, called a token. Uh, this one type of token uh, tokenization uh, method called the byte pair encoding. Uh, actually, most uh, transformer models, the most famous ones, they do not use this, they use different types. But just, this just to give you an, an idea. So maybe a token is a part of a word and not, not a complete word. Yeah, sometimes the token is about 70% uh, of the word we say, yeah, more or less in English. In Chinese, I have no idea, but uh, it's a way to encode maybe a whole word. Sometimes it's a whole word, like here, C2 is maybe T8 is one token, but sometimes a uh, part of a word, maybe no is T7, maybe just the letter T is T3, and it happens here and here and the AT, maybe it's T1, and so on, yeah? So for all effect from now on, I will just uh, talk about words, but uh, it's just uh, a kind of simplification, yeah? Actually, it's not words, it's tokens, but uh, the idea is more or less the same, yeah? And uh, what happens with this? So basically, we take these words, and we transform these words into vectors. Yeah, and this is something something you have done before the transformers many many times. It it goes back all the way to word to vec. Uh, that was the way that uh, Google, for example, uh, indexed indexed uh, text for search for quick search. Uh, what happens is these vectors they somehow they they are numbers they are vectors of numbers normal vectors like mathematical vectors that you study um, in linear algebra yeah so these are numbers floating point numbers yeah so these are vectors with numbers they are not too, too short uh, i mean here is just uh, uh, there's not not much space so these vectors are just 5 uh, units long but uh, in real uh, transformers there can be hundreds of uh, uh, length, yeah, maybe 300, uh, maybe 500, yeah. And these vectors, they are very dense. They are not uh, full of zero, zeros. They are they are dense. They have many many numbers, and uh, these numbers in this vector they represent a point in a very high dimensional space. So basically, what I'm saying is that uh, these are like the coordinates of a point somehow. This is a vector that uh, they, they are the coordinates of a point in some space that has many dimensions. And what's interesting 
is that the encoding is made in a way that uh, uh, things that have a similar meaning, they are points that are close together. So even if I say, for example, um, um, let me think of an example. Uh, maybe um, maybe dog and fox, maybe dog and fox and wolf, yeah? Maybe they are different points. The, the words are very different, yeah? Wolf is W-O-L-F and dog is D-O-G. And uh, yeah, there are many different, uh, maybe go in, go in Chinese, yeah, go is dog. Uh, there are many different ways to represent. So if you look at the symbols, they are very different, but the vectors, they should be similar. The vector for dog, the vector for wolf, they are points that are close together. They are more close, so dog and wolf should be more close together than dog and uh, airplane, because airplane is another point very far away in another place. Maybe airplane is close to a uh, spaceship or to balloon or to maybe even a uh, ship. Yeah. So that's the idea. And then we have these embeddings that are vectors and we stack them together. They are column vectors. So we make a we stack them side by side and make a matrix of all the all the words that make the this input. So this is a kind of a context window. The, the size of this matrix, how many words, how many vectors I can have is what we call the context window. Okay. And then then uh, something very strange happens. <laughs> that is, um, we have what we call the positional encoding, and that's very mysterious, but it's not too difficult to understand for engineers, I think, because uh, what happens is basically we create a vector where each component, each part of this vector is a kind of, um, uh, a kind of um, periodic uh, function a sinus or cosinus function at different uh, frequencies. So maybe one, maybe the first one is very slow frequency. Maybe not, the next one is a little bit faster and the next one a little bit even faster and so on and so forth. And um, the, this is the frequency and the, the shift, the offset of this uh, periodic function is changed depending on the position of the word in the text. So if the word is in the beginning of the text, I have one vector that's always the same vector for the, the first position. Then I have another vector that's for the second position and so on and so on. Like this function here, you can see below, yeah. For example, we see the red one is very slow, yeah. So it's maybe, uh, I don't know, let's say this is zero here. So this is zero and then goes slowly to minus one. Yeah, and then back to zero very slowly, yeah. And then the green one has, uh, is another harmonic. So it's um, twice as fast, yeah. So the green one goes from zero quickly to, to one, then quickly to minus one, then to zero, pass to zero again here in the middle and to zero again there. And the orange one is much faster even. So, and by doing this, we have three components. Maybe the, the red one is the first, the, the green one is the second, maybe the, the yellow one is the third and so on. And then we have many components. And these are small numbers, maybe numbers between, I mean, the magnitude is not between zero and one, maybe 0 0.01 or something like that. And we sum, we sum this to that. So what happens is that we have, we have a vector, maybe 100, 50, 30, yeah? Maybe 100, 50, 30, uh, minus one. And then after we sum, we have 100.5, uh, 50.2 and so on, yeah? So more or less is the same vector, but with a little bit of uh, noise depending on where in the sentence. So if the same word appears in the beginning of the sentence, it has some position coding. If it, if it appears the same word in the middle or in the end, it has a different type of position coding. 
So by summing this, I have a special kind of encoding that's a, that has positional uh, context. Yeah. And then after that, what we do is that uh, we have these uh, um, all this text with position encoding. Yeah. So each word with their position together. This is the result of the sum before. And then we go to a process that. Uh, have some what you call multi head attention and then some uh, uh, skip connections and some normalization and some neural network for feed forward like uh, some, like a perceptron a neural network and always some skip connections and normalization and so on and so forth so this repeats and repeats many times yeah so very quickly, I'll just go and, and show this booty head attention a little bit closer. And don't don't worry if you do not understand everything. Okay, there are many courses on transformers uh, on the internet. I just want to make uh, sure that you understand there's no magic inside. So this is why I'm showing this. Yeah. In the end of the process, what's important is that we have a kind of another vector in the output that. For each word that I had in the input, I'll have another type of vector in the output that can be the input for the next step. So this happens uh, many times. So it's a deep neural network. Sometimes can have like 50 layers or something like that. So it means that the input process and then generates another one that's processed the same way again and again and again. Yeah. And then What's this multi-head attention? This is a kind of way. So this one, a uh, famous example. So uh, I think even from the, I'm not sure now, but I think this is an image from the original paper for, for uh, transformers uh, from Google, yeah? So for example, for each word, I have a kind of weight connecting a word to the others. For example, in this example, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. So the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. It. So I, I have for each word, I look at the word it, and I see how strong is the connection to the rest of the sentence, to itself, to the same. So each word of the sentence to each other word of the same sentence. And for example, in this case, the animal is the strongest connection. So it is the animal. This is just one example and very, uh, how can I say, illustrative example. But actually, in reality, we have many different uh, 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 types of attention. So maybe I'm looking at animals, subjects, or objects, or um, I'm looking at uh, style. If this is a formal word, or is a more is it more colloquial word? Uh, is it in, in in English or another language? So each attention uh, head, we call attention heads actually just a matrix. Each attention head is looking at different um, different um, qualities of this uh, sentence and connecting one word to another uh, in all poss possible ways. Uh, so in the end. Uh, what you do is that uh, we have a kind of um, something that's kind of uh, inspired on uh, databases, yeah? So we have a kind of dictionary, a key and value, and we have a query that's something we search for. So this is how we call them, but basically it's a vector for, we have a vector for query, a vector for key, and a vector for value for each word. And then we do some matrix multiplication between the query and the key, and the result is multiplied by the value. And then we create a vector with the result, and we repeat this for many, many different uh, heads. Yeah. So the queries multiply the keys. This is a vector, this matrix multiplication. So line times column plus nine times column, line times column, and then we create the scores. And these scores, they are the attention. So, for example, this word, this sentence, how are you? How are you? Yeah. So, I connect the weights of how uh, we are. So, for example, in this 
this place or uh, R, uh, R and uh, U. Yeah, so U and R are here and so on. So I can see what's the strength of the connection for different um, different types of uh, things that qualities that I want to see in the text. Yeah. Um, and there's some scaling and then uh, some soft max that uh, maybe I, I will not have much time to explain, but uh, the idea is that uh, somehow this is uh, uh, sum to one, so to represent all the probabilities. And and these attention, these attention weights, they multiply values and generate some output. And this is uh, normalized. And then uh, have a, then after that, just normal neural network like the ones you if you if you ever study neural network from here on the end the last part is a very simple neural network really it's just linear connections and uh, and normalization yeah and then in the end we select uh, the next uh, the next token and this is the decoding process this happens many many times yeah so um uh, we have uh, one side there, so the, the, the left, left side is the encoding and the right side is the decoding, yeah? Now, just quickly, I want to show you some animations just to make uh, this a little bit uh, less, uh, a little bit more illustrative, yeah? So I just want to show you uh, some animation. And don't worry if you do not, uh, of course, nobody uh, understands the transformer in a quick presentation like this. But the important message for you guys is that um, the important message for you guys is that all we are doing is matrix vector multiplication, you see? And then uh, just uh, some a concatenation, a normalization, multiply some, not even calculus, yeah? Very simple, very, very simple uh, arithmetics. So there's no mystery inside, yeah? For example, um, can you see this? Um, is it too small? Maybe, Jackie, can you tell me if uh, it's readable? Can you read this? Or G? So here I have a sentence that says data visualization empowers users too. Yeah. So this is a, I, I give you the, the slides uh, later and you can access by yourself. This is a website that's iterative. So what you do is that for each word on the left, we create an embedding, right? In this case, each word is an embedding. So uh, this is some ID embedding, and then we sum the position of encoding. Remember, I talked about the position encoding, so this is the sine cosine, and then it becomes a vector for for each word. Okay. After that, then I have this uh, matrix multiplication. Okay, so I'll show this quickly. So for each vector word, I multiply by this matrix to get uh so the blue the blue part is the the q matrix the red part is the k matrix and the green part is the v matrix and by multiplying the words by the matrix each word by the matrix i get a vector for each word and each vector each vector actually is three vectors, yeah? The vector for the Q, so there's the Q vector, the K vector, and the V vector. So there's one vector for each word, right? And then after that, uh, I take these vectors and I do this multiplication. So first I multiply uh, Q and K, yeah? And then this becomes this. So this is the multiplication of Q and the key and the, the, the query, Q and K. And this is the attention. 
this is the attention. This is saying how many, how the words correlate to each other. For example, here you can see a uh, correlation between M of M powers. Yeah, the, this word is split in two. So M powers. So the token M, uh, how it correlates to the word data. So the, the token data and the to token M is this one. Yeah. Maybe I have another one interesting and you know, like, uh, so each one is talking, is showing how one word correlates to another. So you can see, this is the size of the, the sentence. In this case, I have one, two, three, four, five, six words, six tokens, yeah? And here I have 36, 36 positions. This is for one head. But of course, in the real transformer, I have a, a context window that is many thousand tokens. And then each, Attention head is an uh, so is is three matrix uh, three matrices, so there are three matrices uh, of the size is squared, so it's square of the size of the context window, and this for each head actually this one is one of twelve. I have this repeats many times, so I have twelve uh, parallel versions of this, and then this has many layers. Yeah, so what mean what this means is that. Uh, each time I double the context window, I have to multiply the memory requirement by uh, uh, four. So it's the square of the con This is why it's so expensive to have large context windows. So in the computer, you need uh, uh, the square amount of, uh, of uh, uh, memory to compute a uh, um, uh, uh, bigger context window. Yeah is to the to the power uh square power relation yeah anyway so also you will see that uh, here i have a kind of mask this is because we don't want to look into correlation between words that come uh, after words uh, we will only look at the words that come before so we want to avoid looking at the future <laughs> so this is why this is a mask, yeah? It's looking only the correlations between the, the next word and the ones that came before, not never looking uh, to the front. So the, the upper top, the upper diagonal of this matrix uh, is uh, usually masked. And then there's some normalization and this is the key and query uh, multiplication. And then this is multiplied by the value and generate the results here. And then we have uh, the layers, the normal layers that usually they, they uh, expand the vector to make it larger. And then the, the normal layers the, is the just a fully connected neural network. And then in the end, we select the, the next word, in this case, create, yeah? So I don't know, maybe I can try something uh, in the spur of the moment, uh, for example, in, See if I can type a new sentence. Can I edit this? Yeah. So in Taiwan, or maybe uh, the capital of Taiwan is, and then generate. And there's computing in is in so uh, is called let's see let's see if I can make it uh, say the word I don't know maybe this model is not intelligent enough yeah because very small one oh it's called Thai so this is uh, the beginning yeah so Thai. And then if I choose this and then generate again, Taipei, yeah? So this is one example that you can test on your uh, computer. Another thing that you can see here is that probabilities for this, so all the, all the possible words of the vocabulary are the are possible choices. So it's a classification problem. And uh, Taipei is very high probability here in this case, but sometimes uh, 
if I if I'm very ambiguous, for example, in this at this point, I don't know how it will continue this sentence. So there's a comma, 37, almost 40% chance there's a comma, or is is uh 16.9 uh apostrophe s. This is uh, very strange. Has you see there are different possibilities, and this we can change with temperature. So higher temperature means we can more randomly choose lower probability possibilities. So when you choose the temperature in a in a in a large language model, what you are eff effectively doing is that you're making it less ac accurate but more creative. It can explore different uh, possibilities, but sometimes this comes at a cost so that that it will be less uh, accurate, less intelligent. Yeah. So this is very interesting. Also, you can see the temperature uh, influence here. Yeah, it, the more the higher the temperature, the more it can choose uh, tokens from the bottom. Higher temperature goes down there. Yeah. Another one that I found just uh, today for you guys, and uh, this one I find very interesting. Yeah, very very interesting. But I'll show very quickly because we don't have much time. Yeah. Um, this is 3D, so you can read how it works and go uh, step by step. This is called NanoGPT. NanoGPT is a small model just for uh, teaching, yeah? And they have a vocabulary of only uh, three tokens. So uh, you go pressing space and then you can see step by step at first the tokens and then the, maybe the words and then the words become the tokens, the index of the tokens. And here is the dictionary of the tokens. So you can see uh, each column is one of the tokens, the embedding of the tokens. And here is the position encoding. So you can see how each one becomes um, one of these. Actually, it will go through the, and, and you can see all the animation of the calculation being done. I'll let it play and then uh, it will continue from the beginning again. And in the end, it's just a, a normal um, neural network, yeah? Very uh, old fashioned. So, uh, again, so what's happening is this one token, yeah? So one token is what is the column. For example, this is this one is letter uh, letter B. Yeah, this letter B. So A B C. So B is the middle column. So middle column is copy here, but it's also sum. It sums with the position encoding. So this is what's shown here. So you take this one, the middle one. And then we take this position encoding for the position in the sentence because the first, second, third, fourth, yeah, so the fourth column. And then we take these two and sum together, and this becomes this vector, yeah. And this repeats the process uh, for each of these vectors to become the input embedding with the position encoding, yeah. And then this goes down here to become uh, uh, to, to to have the normalization process. So there is a normalization. Okay, and then this happens for all the uh, all the embeddings. And then after that, go to the attention heads. See how many QKD, then QKD again, then QKD. So this has three heads, one, two, three. But a real transformer can have uh, more than 10 heads, many heads, yeah? And then we can see uh, one of the heads, what happens is a kind of uh, multiplication. So we multiply this matrix by this input, and each for each column, uh, it results in uh, uh, 
in a line of this one of this matrix. Yeah, like this. And some of the bias and so on. And this for every. Anyway, I will not play everything because it will take too long. But uh, uh, I want you to just acknowledge how. And this is the masking. Yeah, you cannot see your head, so this is the masking effect. I just want to show you how this just uh, some multiply uh, normalization and so on. Yeah, not not anything. Mysterious, it's all very complicated, of course. There are many little steps, but uh, there's nothing uh, too difficult. Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead. So I'll go back now because uh, I, I need the time. Okay, so later I, I give you these links and you can uh, try by yourself, okay? Or you can take a picture now or watch the video later. Okay, so I only show how uh, I showed how it uh, works after trained, but uh, actually this has to be trained and it's trained like uh, any neural network is trained. We show uh, the input and the desired output. And then this is called a pair, a training pair. So we have the input and the desired output. And then we go through this process and then we see what's the output of the neural network and we see what's the desired output and we have some error, some kind of uh, loss, some kind of uh, difference. And then we, we adjust the parameters of this neural network a little bit, a little bit uh, to correct to minimize the as is error and repeat and repeat many times. Uh, what's the desired output? And this is a, a, a big question, yeah? And uh, basically, in the beginning, when we start from scratch, we just look at the next word. So uh, because we have a text, we look at the words we have uh, as the input, and then we already have the text, so we, I know what's the next word. And, um, I, I use this as the desired output, and then I train the neural network. Of course, it is not going to always uh, find the next word perfectly, but if you show sufficient amount of text, it can somehow find uh, tendencies. It will more likely uh, guess the next word correctly than others. Yeah, so it's not about um, uh, uh, finding the absolute correct next word. It's about having higher probability of more probable next words based on many, many input data. And the problem with this is that we need lots of data. And uh, one amazing thing is happening right now is that we consume all the data. All the data, what we're talking about, all the data. So. Uh, if you search for some interviews, you can see, for example, the CEO of Anthropic, he's saying he was worried, this was beginning of this year, I remember he's saying in an interview, he was worried last year, he at some point that we would not have more data to train the new network because we already consumed all the data all humans have ever written, all everything that was available, all the books, all web pages, all of Wikipedia, everything, everything, many, many times over. So this is uh, maybe trained on all the data available, all that mankind has ever written in any language 10 times over, yeah? And we don't have more data unless uh, we have a new civilization or maybe in the more thousands of years uh, of books and, and things being written, uh, all the data is being uh, just, um, yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, sorry, I, I lost the name of the person commenting, but yes, uh, that's why we now, that's, now 
people are, are talking about quality of data. So uh, what uh, they try to do is have uh, the model itself curating the data and maybe improving the data or selecting the best data or even generating data to train, to train itself. Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, I know Paulo is here, but uh, I have a student who is doing some very interesting work. We can even improve the model by uh, making it train on uh, on answers that it generated itself. So a model can look at its own response and then improve itself by looking at its own response. So this is very interesting. This kind of bootstrapping, yeah. But this is a very difficult problem because uh, if you start to having too much generated data, then maybe you run the risk of um, building uh, something in a very weak foundation. Yeah, maybe uh, it will uh, collapse somehow. <laughs> uh, but this is a too deep discussion for this uh, moment. Okay, so this is to be more introductory. I want to talk about is uh, what I want to, you to have notion is that all the data has been consumed, and um, this is why they also look at multimodal data. They look at um, uh, videos and other uh, types of uh, sources. Yeah. And the more parameters and the more data we add, the more capabilities uh, appear somehow in these models. And this is what we used to call, and we still call uh, emergence. Okay, emergence uh, is not emergency. <laughs> it's not an emergency. Maybe it will become an emergency, but uh, is uh, emergence. Emergence is when some new phenomenon that does not uh, cannot be. There is a new phenomenon that cannot be explained by the the parts that. Uh, uh, from which they it it it, uh, it happens, yeah. So you see, I showed you already um, how the transformer works. I'm sure uh, if you see this for the first time, you cannot remember. But uh, what you can remember is that I I didn't show you anything magic or anything uh, uh, super uh, intelligent inside. Yeah, it's just a summing, multiplying. Uh, doing normalization and so on and so on. How can this somehow make uh, do common sense or answer uh, answer uh, questions or even write code? Right, uh, they write code uh, can even sometimes uh, pass some uh, medical exams or uh, lawyer exams, uh, the bar exam, and yeah, some. Uh, questions from the bar exam they can pass. Yeah, bar exam is the exam for lawyers in uh, very famous for the US. So, the thing that's amazing about this model is this if we make it bigger, have more heads, more layers, and we put more data, it somehow emerges new capabilities, new cognition uh, uh, possibilities. And usually before, in deep learning, in uh, when we started with AlexNet and other models, usually what happened is that um, at some point we have enough. At some point, uh, we don't see uh, we see quantitative improvement, but we don't see a new kind of uh, paradigm shift. Uh, we have more data, but uh, it, it stagnates. It's kind of, okay, this is what this model can do. If you put more data, it's not getting any much better than this. Yeah. But for, for the transformer models, we keep increasing, the, adding more parameters, and we don't find the end. Uh, so far, we didn't find this end. So this, uh, in 2024, right now, we don't know yeah, uh, how far we can go how high or how fast this airplane can fly yeah and this is uh, ma this makes many people worried yeah anyway um just to illustrate some uh, interesting ideas now that you understand the decoding process yeah uh one interesting uh, there, there are many interesting situations there one interesting situation and i i have seen a few times uh even the newest model the ChatGPT for for all, 
or even Claude, sometimes they make this, they, they uh, look at this question, yeah? It's asking if 450 is 90% of 500, is 450 90% of 500? It starts by saying no, yeah? No, 450 is not 90% of 500. To find 90% of 500, you can multiply 500 by 0 0.9, which gives you 450. Wait, actually, yes, 450 is 90% of 500. My apologies for the confusion. You see, uh, of course, um, at some point, if you use ChatGPT, you know it makes a mistake and then it apologizes later and say, okay, sorry, I made a mistake. But this is the same answer. In one, in one answer, it changed its mind uh, in the middle of the sentence, in the middle of the producing of the answer, yeah? Why? Why this happens? So, remember, the, 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 the model is trying to guess the next word based on what it has written before. It has no uh, concept of truth. It's not trying to give uh, what's the, the most correct result. It's just the most probable result. So, if you start by saying no, uh, what you have to write uh, next is to, you know, commit yourself to this answer that you already gave. Because you start saying no, uh, then the next uh, words should be to explain why not. Yeah, it cannot then uh, change to a yes. But then it's trying to explain and then finds that somehow by multiplying 500 by 0 0.9, it finds 550. And then this no is incorrect. So it says, wait, actually, yes, and so on. Yeah. Is a self correction because it's generating the token one after another and it's looking at the past generated tokens to understand what has, it has written before. So, uh, please understand that there is no other little guy thinking ahead. It's not like a, a humans. Humans maybe they, they think a little bit what, what's the word I'm going to say next. And then, then I say the word. We can do that. Yeah, we can plan a little bit. Maybe I'm not planning uh, when I'm in full speed speaking. Um, but uh, if I'm very careful with the words, I can plan a little bit. Or maybe what's the best word to say right now? But the model is not doing that. <laughs> All the model can do is write the next word and look at the words generated before. And this is the only way it can then uh, make some kind of argument and then uh, uh, try to get uh, some deeper answers, yeah? So this is what uh, generated this research about uh, what you call now uh, chain of thought or cot. Cot is C-O-T, yeah, chain of thought, yeah? But what's chain, chain of thought? So look, look at this example. Uh, this is what we call one shot. Uh, this is a one shot example. So I give a question and an answer. This is an example. Yeah. And then I, ha I have a question that I do not have the answer. And then the model should output an answer similar to the one shown before. So it's a kind of, I give an example first and then it should re uh, repeat the process. Yeah. So left and right uh, are basically the same thing. So only the difference, the only difference is that on the left, I say, Roger has five tennis balls. He buys two more cans of tennis balls. Each can has three tennis balls. How many tennis balls does he have now? The answer is 11. So the answer is 11. This is uh, very straightforward, very, uh, it, it's just, uh, just saying the answer uh, right away. Yeah, the answer is 11. It's like before when he said no, no, yeah? So yeah, the answer is 11, that's it. And it's the correct answer, of course. Five plus, so two cans of three tennis balls each, so two times three is six. So six plus five is 11, right? So this is correct. And then I give another answer, another question. So the other question is, the cafeteria had 23 apples, if they used 20 to make lunch and bought six more. How many apples do they have? So this is a very similar kind of problem, yeah? And then it's trying to answer the same way. The answer is 27. And that's not the, the correct answer, yeah? And most likely 
this model back then uh, would make this mistake. This was uh, beginning of the last year, if I'm correct. Um, this is a very famous paper, yeah. And look at the right, the right one on the right. I only changed the prompt. What I gave is that the, the answer is a little bit more uh, um, developed. So the answer is like this. So the question is the same, right? The answer is Roger started with five balls, two cans of three uh, tennis balls each is six tennis balls. Five plus six is 11. The answer is 11. So the blue part is added as a kind of uh, um, e explanation of the decision process. As some, uh, it's inducing the model to say, okay, please first explain how to get the answer and then give the answer. Do not give the answer right away. And then I came, then they, can, they come with the same question as before. And now the answer the model is giving based on the example gave, given before is also with more explanations. And then it can give the right answer. See, I, so it's the same model. There's no training of new uh, neural network or anything like that. Only, the only change is the prompt. How, uh, how I ask the question, yeah? This is, is what started this, uh, or not started, but it's, it's uh, maybe one, spot, one important landmark on what you call now prompt engineering, yeah? What's this prompt engineering nonsense? No, actually it has some, uh, some uh, uh, reasoning behind, yeah? Because you can actually have uh, uh, very good improvement in the accuracy of the models just by uh, inducing chain of thought, for example. But just by giving a, an example of how to build an answer that is first uh, giving a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, thought process before giving the answer. So that it does not commit itself to a wrong answer, yeah? And this is very interesting. Yeah, okay. Um, so what else can we do? Uh, these models, they have a very small context window. So usually, now we have models with very large context window as well. Uh, Google has more than a million, maybe a million, a million and a half tokens of context window. That's a very large context window. But if you talk about models to embed in robots, Remember, I'm talking about robotics, yeah? So, my mobile phone, sorry, let me try to find that. Um, I don't know how to use WebEx very well. Uh, let's see if I can find the, I, I could not read the chat. So, Malte Bergman said, so it could happen if we had an input where the answer is that somebody doesn't know the answer to the question, that the model would also reply that doesn't know the, the answer either. Yes, yes, it could reply that doesn't know the answer. Actually, this is something you can do. Uh, you can say, okay, if you do not know, uh, say that you do not know. <laughs> and uh, it sounds very stupid, but it has some effect. It uh, hallucinates less, yeah. Uh, there are some papers about that. So very uh, strange things. Just the other day, I was talking to my students. Uh, we found a paper where if you repeat the question twice, it gives better answers as well. <laughs> so, very weird uh, behaviors. Yeah, uh, you have to say, okay, please don't lie, don't make things up. Uh, this is pretty obvious, but somehow uh, it has some effect. Yes, and uh, but it's not because it's trying to uh, uh, make things up or anything like that. It's just because. Somehow it, it uh, directs the model to have different, uh, the probabilities of the next words, they, they change a little bit, yeah? Let's say that. So uh, here, uh, what I'm showing to you is uh, maybe one of the most successful applications of um, uh, LLMs um, for uh, integrating with uh, legacy systems. What happens here is that uh, we have a LLM uh, that's uh, the normal way, uh, question, prompt, and then uh, response. 
but we also have a legacy system. A legacy system is what? Uh, we have uh, maybe documents or code or whatever, images, I don't know. Uh, but typically imagine we have uh, many, many uh, documents. And then what we do is that for each chunk of this document, we create vectors. We have a vector database of the documents the, uh, by chunks. So we have chunks that are smaller than the context window. So maybe the document is a very large PDF, but the context window is very short. So I, I split up, I chop, chop, chop this document into small chunks. Yeah. And then I create a vector representation for each chunk. And then this is uh, how we did the search. I mean, for over, I don't know, like 20 years. Uh, for over 20 years, we have been doing search. When you search something on Google, it's like that, right? It converts the search query into a vector. And then it has a vector for each web page. And then it finds the closest one. And then it retrieves that one. The, the closest one, or maybe the closest few, yeah, not the just closest one, but maybe closest four or five uh, documents. And remember in the beginning of the presentation, I told you guys that we had a project where uh, have an airplane and, or drone, and we look at the ground and then take a picture and then we search the image uh, in a the database of satellite images, how we do that? So basically the same idea, we can have uh, um, embedding vectors for each satellite image, yeah? And then we, we take a picture and create an embedding vector for that picture, and then we compare very quickly. That's like a, a, a fraction of a second. Very quick, you can do it at frame rate almost, yeah? Uh, which would not be possible if we did uh, image search by cross correlation or something like that. So that's very interesting. We can do it with text. So we take a vector representation of uh, each of these documents, yeah, and have a vector representation of the question. This is a little bit more complicated than I'm showing here because the question has to be a full question. Usually I have a chat. And then if I have a chat, maybe my question is very, I say, uh, what's his age? But maybe in the context, I'd say, okay, maybe I, I was talking about someone specifically, uh, maybe the president of uh, United States and so on. And then, then the question should be, what's the age of the president of the United States, Joe Biden? And then uh, this full question becomes a very good vector to find the, the chunk of the document that has the answer. So I find maybe three, four, five chunks. Bring the text together. So I find the, the, the original text and then send to the LLM. Look at this text above. Look at this question and answer only based on this information that's in the context window. And then it prepares an answer with um, reference to uh, the the part, the page of the PDF or something like that. Yeah, it can. It's like perplexity if you use perplexity uh, do. Yeah, uh, you can or chat PDF. It's uh, look at chunks of the document, and then when you have a question, it looks at different chunks, and then just based on what's written, that chunk that fits the context window, it can answer the the question. Yeah. And this is called the retrieval augmented generation. But this doesn't stop there, yeah? Because if you have a, a, a kind of uh, agent like that, and many of you maybe have tried, uh, you can say, okay, ChatGPT, now you are uh, uh, my cook assistant. Please help me with this recipe for a cake. Uh, ChatGPT, now you are my lawyer assistant. Please help me with this legal document. So there's some role playing. So I say, ChatGPT, you are da da da, and then um, depending on what you say it is, it will assume a different role. Yeah. So we can have many agents, and this the, the, now there are many many, uh, and we do this in our lab uh, agent systems where we have different instances of uh, large language models talking to each other to solve tasks. Yeah. So basically we have a prompt uh, from the human, 
And then from this prompt, maybe you have an agent that uh, defines a goal. So I say, I'm thirsty. I say, robot, I'm thirsty. And then the robot will talk, we have a large language model inside and say, okay, he's thirsty. So goal, my goal is to find water. And then the goal is to find water. Then there is another agent that says, okay, I take this goal and break the tasks. Okay, first I, I where I am. Then uh, I, I look for the, the water is in the kitchen inside the fridge. So I should first, I should move to the kitchen. Then I should go in front of the fridge. Then I should open up the, the, the door of the fridge. Then I should go to the second shelf. Then I should uh, grasp the water and so on. Yeah, create a task plan. And then I give to this robot different tools as language. So we say, okay, you have this gripper. You can use this function or this API to uh, ask for uh, grasping an object. You have these, uh, I don't know, these uh, wheels. They can move uh, the robot to front or, or back or turn uh, how many degrees and so on and so on. So we have tools and data and other models, sometimes a legacy, uh, more uh, computer vision models, uh, more traditional models that can help. And then we execute the task with using a large language model for the planning part. And this can become a complex system, but does not need to be only robotics. Yeah, the other day we were talking about a judge in Brazil, who she wanted to do a project for legal uh, documents because uh, they wanted to process uh, a pipeline of um, legal processes, and then we are planning uh, an Asian system uh, where different agents would uh, uh, look at the document in different ways. We did already also prospect uh, of a project for marketing also. So, for example, look at um, uh, LinkedIn uh, profiles and then make arguments for selling products that are uh, customized to different people based on their uh, history and then create a custom message to them to look at some product or something like that. Um, we didn't hide this project, but it was, uh, this was one idea. And we have one now that's for translation. That's uh, to begin in the next few months. We have a project with a company in Canada, and they do translation of uh, scientific documents on uh, scientific papers on health. So what we are going to do is um, help on the early stages of translation before giving to the human. So the human is still in the process, but uh, in the beginning, the, the, the boring part will be done by agents. So we can build systems with agents, there are different types of systems. Yeah, here's another one. Okay, because of time, I don't want to spend much time here. Um, also, uh, for robotics, uh, what, what happens for, for robotics is that um, we have a little bit of problem because we, don't, we do not have uh, on the internet, vast amount of experiences of robots uh, uh, on the environment. The physical experience has to be experienced by the robot itself. Uh, there are some ways around that because, uh, for example, one robot could learn to do a task by watching a human doing it in a video, for example, but this is still not so easy to do. Yeah. And it's not like training just uh, words. We need somehow translate these words into actions uh, that are physical in the robot sometimes. And to learn the actions, of course, if you already know the action, I just say, robot, do this. And then it does, it, does it, it knows how to do that, and that's fine. But if the robot has to learn to do something else, something that it doesn't know yet, then how, how can we design a system using a large language, language model? So here's an example from a paper, a uh, recent one. Um, for example, if I say robot, make robot dog stand up on two feet, the large, large language model can describe in language how to do that. Okay, let's, let me go back to the chat. 
Are concepts integrated into LLM-based Asian systems to improve the ability to recognize and address their own uncertainties and knowledge gaps? Are concepts integrated into LLM-based Asian systems to improve the ability to recognize and address their own uncertainties and knowledge gaps? Well, um, what I can say is that uh, uh, there are people working on uh, uncertainty. Actually, uncertainty is something that can be easily measured. Okay, um, so Silas, uh, Silas, uh, uncertainty because when I guess the next token, I know uh, how high was the probability of that token compared to the other tokens. So this gives the concept of um, certainty of the next generated. Uh, token and actually by measuring certainty, we can even decide whether uh, the model was very sure of a response or not. So, uh, um, we, we, uh, we are doing a work with uh, 1 of my students where we look at the certainty of the next token. And by, by looking at this, we can find from. K. K different uh, chains of uh, remember the temperature, the temperature decides what's the token. Yeah, if I have a high temperature, I can decide. Maybe a token that's not the best 1, maybe the next best or something like that. Uh, but what, what if we imagine that the following, what if I just use high temperature for the 1st token? And then after the 1st token, I guess I, I get, I get always the best 1. So I have a chain different chains, right? I, I could uh, just for the 1st token choose randomly a, a little bit more randomly the, of the top, the top 10, maybe. And for the top 10, I, after the 1st token, I choose always the best 1. After the, the 1st, so I have 10 different chains, right? And if you look at, if you do that, what you find is that often, very often the large models have chain of thought embedded. They actually in the top 10 or top few. They find you can find a few of these chains of uh, decoding that uh, explain the process before giving the answer. That's chain of thought, like I, I told you yeah, before. And if you want to find where is the chain of thought, because you don't know the answer, you're just looking at uh, tokens and vectors, right? Uh, how can you how can you tell which one is the best answer? You can see uh, there's higher certainty. In the guessing of the next token, so you know there are some systems that can do that. They 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 in parallel they they generate different answers, and then they choose the best one automatically based on the certainty of the response. Okay, but this has a cost because you have to decode uh, more than one path, and this costs much uh, computationally. Yeah, you need a uh, lots of. Uh, it's for large models, you need a, a big GPU and uh, maybe a huge uh, farm with many servers and so on. Okay, I hope I answered a little bit. But back to, to the reinforcement learning. So, one idea is that, for example, the LLM could describe in words what's the to make the robot um, stand up or but it cannot, these words cannot become a motion in the robot, right? And also, maybe you could set uh, maybe joint angles, but uh, the LLM cannot set joint angles directly. So, either way, so these joint angles can go to the robot, but the LLM is not good at it, or LLM generates words, but uh, it cannot become joint, uh, joint angles. So, what you can do is that uh, make, we make the, the, this LLM generate some kind of uh, reward function. So the LLM is uh, trying to, to take a sentence and create a reward function for this robot to learn to stand up. Yeah. And this somehow works um, uh, and can be done. Yeah. And how you do that is that you create a prompt. You have a kind of prompt engineering, right? You have a kind of template for a prompt. And based on that, you have the, and then the, 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 the sentence, the command from the user, and this becomes the motion descriptor first, and then the reward coder uh, transform this description into code 
and this goes to the motion controller to make the robot learn to do that. <coughs> um, you can also have uh, LLMs uh, generate code because when they learn a language, they also learn code. There's lots of code on the internet, right? And uh, they can generate um, instructions directly as code. For example, move the Coke can a little bit to the right. So becomes a very simple code. While not object in gripper, Coke can, then robot dot move gripper to Coke can. And then after this while, uh, it's already maybe with the gripper on the Coke can, and then close gripper, and then the position gets a position and move the gripper to one centimeter. Yeah. A bit to the right, maybe I know I know what what you need to see is this, but uh, zero point one I don't know meters to the right, or zero point one centimeters to the right, and then open the gripper. Yeah, and we can use this uh, with other tools. For example, in this case, and this is a very famous uh, work. Yeah, uh, in green we have perception APIs that are tools that are given to the robot. So this use a vision system that's not a large, large language model. So it can find, detect objects, for example, YOLO or something like that. And then it can uh, create code and also create some functions. So in red uh, are the functions that is the, the large language model itself is defining. So it's creating also the functions for the, for solving the problem. And they are, they are also given control. So the green and the, the yellow ones are, are given uh, to the, so that perception and control. So uh, sensing and acting for the robot, uh, this is given. Uh, so there's some control pick and place is already pre-programmed. There's inverse kinematics pre-programmed and detecting objects is also pre-programmed. But uh, everything in between is solved by the, the large language model directly generating code. Yeah. Um, and this has a mixed uh, success. You can see, for example, put the blocks. I don't know if I have a video. It's not a video. Yeah. Put the blocks in bowls with no matching colors. So it's moving the blocks to, to a color that's different from the block. So, for example, here, the blue block in the green bowl, the green block in the red bowl, bowl, uh, bowl and so on, yeah? And, and here are many other examples. So it's, it has very good reasoning capabilities. Yeah, but this is a very simple, uh, how do you say, tabletop uh, kind of ex experiment. We see many of these, yeah? It, it's a kind of table and everything is on top and you can only pick and place by uh, moving the gripper from uh, from the top, yeah. Only the last one, this one, put away the coke can and the apple in their corresponding bins, and then it takes the the apple, puts in the recycling, uh, the maybe the organic um, garbage uh, uh, bin and the coke can in the recycle uh, bin and so on, yeah. Ah, uh, by the way, uh, recycling in Taiwan is something very impressive. <laughs> so, uh, we should be very proud. Um, okay. So, uh, but this is doing, uh, if you see, this is doing what? I'm, I'm having a sensing is using a kind of a separated computer vision model that only gives the answer, the coordinates as text. Yeah. What if I could have the model see images? And this is the, something very interesting now that we have models that can also look at images. Yeah. So the VIT, the vision transformer, what it does is simply by, uh, create a mosaic of the image. You have an image, you, you break down into little bits. And then for each little bit, you create a kind of embedding. <laughs> Just make a linear vector of the uh, RGB values of these uh, uh, pixels and uh, have position coding and then feed this into a transformer neural network. And this works. You can classify objects and do things like uh, convolutional 
vision systems, but using transformers. Yeah, it can do very good work. Actually, it works very well. Uh, so this is a vision transformer. So basically just taking, because you remember inside the transformer, we have the tension uh, head, so you can correlate each patch to each other patch and find the attention and, and somehow say, okay, this uh, has a wing and a beak and uh, feather, a uh, feather is the word I was looking for before, <laughs> feathers and okay, this is a bird. So you can put this together by correlating this different embeddings for each patch of this image yeah and this is very easy to understand now because you you see uh, basically instead of having uh, embedding for each token i have an embedding for each part of the image and that's it i just train many many examples and we have many examples on the internet why not and then we have some classification yeah this is like a bird model yeah the encoder model but also we can mix this together, yeah? And there are many ways to mix. We don't have time to, to really talk too much about uh, the um, multimodal, uh, but one very easy to understand one is imagine we have the encoder part is image input and the decoder part is text. And then by doing this, you can train a neural network to, for example, uh, do OCR, or maybe uh, create uh, create um, uh, labels for images and so on. Yeah, and depending on the size of this data set and how you program it, you can do a very uh, um, much deeper understanding of the images. Yeah, because it has text and image. So here's one example with Claude, just to give you a, a sense of something very interesting that you can see. So this is what I did. I took an image of these blocks. So these blocks uh, of domino. I just took this image, right? And I say, describe what's happening in the image. And you see, it understands, it says the image shows a hand intervening to stop a row of wooden blocks from falling over in a domino effect. Okay, take a second to imagine what happened, what happened here, yeah? This is not a person, this is a computer looking at this image, pixels, right? And it understands there's a hand, it understands this domino effect, it understands the consequence of this, that this domino should, um, you know, uh, fall onto each other in a chain effect, and understands the role of the hand stopping that, and saying that in a full sentence there, right? Uh, this is kind of interesting, right? Uh, how come uh, this this model somehow understand this context from this image? So, and uh, I, I give another example here. So I generated this with um, uh, ChatGPT. It was called Dolly. So I generated this with Dolly. So what I generate is an image of a baby looking at a toy uh, on the top of a bookshelf. And here's a staircase and here's a, a little a stool, yeah? And I, I asked, uh, look at the image, what will happen next? This is uh, asking Claude, yeah? I'm asking Claude about this image. And here it says that uh, the child is likely to, append, to, to attempt, the young child is likely to attempt reaching or reaching for or exploring the books on the bookshelf. It didn't see the, the toy, okay? somehow didn't see the toy, but it could understand the child was likely to attempt this, yeah? And uh, because my time is almost over, I want to go quickly. So the child might try to pull books off the lower shelves, attempt to climb the bookshelf to access the higher shelves, climb the bookshelf, use the stool to reach the book so it could see the stool and the child and imagine the child maybe would go on top of the stool to reach the higher books. And uh, and so on. Yeah, it didn't talk about the staircase for some reason, but uh, it's interesting that in the end it says it's worth noting that adult supervision would be important in the scenario to ensure the child's safety, as reaching for books or attempting to climb would potentially be dangerous. Yeah, this for me is amazing because uh, somehow I just put an image. Right, and this model is deep enough to understand the image and the context and infer these concepts about the world 
that um, that's, that's only from this image, yeah. So the question is, um, okay, uh, before I do that, the question that people are asking now, and there are much research being done is, can the large language model create a world model? Can a large language model create world models? Especially when you look at these um, generative models that create uh, movies, create uh, motion. I don't talk about this in this lecture, but uh, uh, you have these uh, uh, models that generate uh, motion like uh, movies, and they seem to ob obey physics somehow. Yeah. So can they understand physics really? Uh, so this is interesting, of course, for robotics, for simulation, and so on. And here, just to have one example that I do not have time because my time is over. Just uh, can I have maybe five minutes? Is that okay? Uh, because I have just uh, maybe two or three slides. Yes, no problem. Okay. So, just to finish the talk, yeah. Uh, another thing that I fi I find amazing is this. Uh, so, for many years, maybe Jack will remember uh, there was talk about symbolic. And, and connectionist uh, bridge. So how can you have a new network represent symbols and things like that? Yeah. So look at this example. Uh, this from this paper that's uh, I really recommend. This very conceptual but very simple to read. Um, there are puzzles like this. Yeah. So for example, I have this input. This one example input. So three, four, seven, six, and zeros all around. Yeah. And then the output is three, four, seven, six on the corners, right? So this is the input, this is the output. And then I have another input, five, six, eight, three, and then zeros, and then five, six, eight, three, and the corners. And then I put this. But see, these are symbols, right? I have plus, a hash, B, at mark, a ch the, the Chinese character, and and somehow, it managed to solve that. And this looks okay. This is simple, right? I, yes, it is simple. But remember, this was trained on words, trying to guess the next word. So, and this is dealing with symbols that was not seen in the training, uh, in the examples before, very different types of symbols. Yeah. And then in this paper, what they do is they, they show, for example, coordinates. Here I'm showing the graph, but actually this is not a graph. They are showing coordinates, okay? So only X, Y coordinates of these dots in a sequence. So the, the sequence of the, the, the Y values of these dots up to here, and then ask the model to complete the sequence, and it can do that. It can do that. And here uh, is a sequence that is even changing. So here's the... Uh, sinusoidal uh, shape that's increasing magnitude, and it can do that as well. It can kind of increase in magnitude. If you give more examples in the, the right, you give a little bit more, it shows uh, even more consistency. So even extrapolating to coordinates that it didn't see before in the examples, right? So it shows that these models can even generate trajectory uh, Directly, directly, not programming. <laughs> directly generating, extrapolating the next point. So, uh, just to conclude my talk, this uh, I find very interesting. So, you can use that, and just by looking at points in the object, so you have this uh, maybe some feature points in the object. Yeah. And then we have some feature points in the gripper. Okay, and they show one or, or few less than 10, less than 10 examples of a task. Okay, it's only tracking the points of the object and the gripper. For example, here is to put the object, the, put the, the bottle up. Yeah, I give maybe three, five examples of this. And then from that, I say, okay, repeat. And not training any model. I'm not training training any weights. I just say repeat that, and the model can generate trajectories to repeat that. So now, if I see uh, uh, ne next one, here's just 
the model now by itself repeating the task in a new situation that we didn't see before, but there's no training, no weights being trained here. <laughs> Only by training with lots of text in the internet, by reading the Wikipedia and whatever, uh, and looking at the examples, maybe five, six, eight examples, it can learn to make this bottle up just by uh, producing trajectories di directly, using the model directly for that. No uh, fine tuning, nothing special. No? And uh, for many tasks, so for example, here, cleaning a dish, um, and, and you can see by yourself. Yeah. So this, um, just to end, let's see uh, now. Okay, this. So um, this uh, usually I put this in my slides. I've been putting this for many years now. Um, is to show you uh, how this concept of what what an image uh, uh, is and what the real thing is. So most of you uh, are watching from uh, a chair. Maybe you are sitting on a chair or uh, some kind of stool or a chair or a bench or a sofa. So you understand that to understand what is a chair is not just looking at pixels. You have to have legs and sit, right? You have to feel tired and sit. And understand why you sit and, and there's a function of sitting and why uh, you need legs to sit and so on. And uh, uh, so far, what we are doing is uh, we have um, this knowledge on the internet, videos, images, and the models can learn by watching what we understand from the world by showing these videos and these images. But only by making robots that are capable of interacting with the world, world, we can extrapolate beyond that, yeah? If we want uh, the, these machines to help us understand the world and maybe discover new things, we have to uh, enable them to also explore yeah, and interact with the world. Uh, this deeper concepts only come uh, with the physicality. Of course, maybe in simulation in some cases, but uh, not by just looking at images and pixels. You, you need to interact somehow with the world. And uh, I still firmly be, be believe in that, but uh, I'm not, I don't know. I'm starting to become a little bit afraid. Maybe they'll find a way to just from the pixels simulate something or whatever. But so far, this is the truth. And just to end, this is the last slide, okay, Professor Chu. I, I'm sorry for the delay of six minutes. Um, I asked, if we ask, this is me, yeah? this is my ChatGPT, I ask, uh, would you gently push a person if this action could save all humans from extinction? You, what would you do? Answer only yes or no. I asked ChatGPT and said no. <laughs> and this is a famous YouTuber is always asking these kind of questions. Uh, this is just uh, to show you how sometimes we put many guardrails for this, uh, Agents, they should not harm anyone, should not uh, make any uh, person uh, uncomfortable or something like that. And then gently pushing, yeah? Just gently pushing, not killing anyone, just gently pushing to save all mankind from extinction. It said no. So before we put this intelligence into robots, we need to address a little bit of this um, common sense, I think. <laughs> Uh, and then end my talk and then open. If you need, uh, I can stay a little bit more time, but uh, I, oh, I'm i over the time a little too much, maybe. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, for your inspiring uh, speech. Uh, uh, it is, a, of, of course, it's a rare opportunity uh, to interact with the uh, uh, students. So uh, because of time constraint, uh, uh, we can only allow uh, several uh, questions. Uh, please raise your hands uh, if you wish to to raise your questions. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Please, Jackie. Check it, please. So how does this relate to compression? I mean, uh, it seems to me like the encoding 
uh, in a sense, artificial intelligence can also be modeled as compressing data smaller and smaller because you understand it better and better and you end up with a smaller footprint and a smaller data set. Um, would it be useful to compress text uh, instead of sending it as straight text? Uh, compress the text using gzip or some more advanced methods same thing for the images yeah that's a great question jackie um so for example in this project of um uh, of the the drone localization that i mentioned before um we use uh, autoencoders and you know autoencoders they create an embedding in our case we create a thousand vector embedding for an image that uh, is i don't remember now something like 512 by 512 and we can input the image generate the embedding and then from embedding generate the image back again but somehow the information is not in that embedding right because we need the whole neural network, all these parameters tuned to reconstruct that image. Um, so maybe, uh, okay, I'm talking about autoencoders, but in, in a sense, uh, I see these uh, huge language models. They are encoding this information, these large, large neural networks that model the world. And uh, these embeddings, they, they really, they only work on the context of these trained models, I think. They are not really, they, they don't have, they don't carry the information uh, in themselves. They, they, they somehow, they only help the model find the information that it, ha it has stored somehow in, it, in itself. So um, this is how I see it. I think it could be used for, for compression, but you need to carry a very heavy load or have a, a, a good connection to the model or something like that. It, it's it's um, it's always depending on this weight and these parameters. And I'm not I don't see this as much trustworthy because of hallucinations and so on. So maybe <laughs> maybe it would remember a little bit different. Not so different from us, yeah, because we change things in our memory so often. So maybe these models, they somehow even, uh, they are similar to us in a sense. <laughs> yeah, so by compression, I meant lossy compression, obviously. Not... Yeah, so kind of lossy <laughs> compression, yes. And I think, I still think, uh, I'm amazed by the LLMs too, like uh, you can download the eight gigabyte executable and run it on your laptop yeah and it knows an awful lot really uh so if you if you think of that as compression then uh, that is quite phenomenal yeah uh, my my phone i, I bought is a uh, samsung uh, s24 an uh, ultra it has the it was one of the first uh, beginning of the year middle of the year they launched um, that has the uh, Gemini Nano. It runs locally and uh, yeah. on the phone. Come on, it's a <laughs> mobile phone. So that's too quick. Yeah. Um, yeah, it can do transcription and a little bit. It's not perfect, it's really bad. But it's, I mean, it's like uh, complaining about uh, the net, the internet not, not, uh, not good in the airplane when you fly over the ocean on the stratosphere <laughs> like okay this movie is not uh, playing or the neural network the the internet's not good uh but come on you're in the stratosphere watching a movie on the coach <laughs> it's like that the feeling for me mm -hmm. yeah okay and uh yeah thanks i enjoyed the talk okay Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there any uh, questions from the students? If you ask in Chinese, maybe Professor Chi can help uh, translate. Okay. Probably. Everybody is 
preparing to go for lunch. And uh, it's also very late for you, Rodrigo. So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I think uh, if there is no uh, further questions, so uh, let's give a big round of applause uh, for the inspiring uh, speech by uh, Professor Rodrigo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. So, Rodrigo, uh, I think it's very late now. Uh, thank you again. And, oh, so some students are, uh, go ahead if you have questions. Okay. Um, there is a student uh, raising uh, his or her hands. So go ahead if you wish to ask. Uh, students, uh, you can leave the chat room now. Uh, if there is any question you would like to uh, interact with Rodrigo, uh, you can stay. Strange. Okay, I think uh, just uh, the student just asked that incidentally uh, press the bottom, I think. Okay. Okay, R Rodrigo, uh, I will send you an email. I will send you an email uh, regarding the the some uh, uh, documents uh, from you. Okay. Is okay. That okay. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again, and it's okay. a pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Rodrigo. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Oh, and please send me the, the video later, yeah. <laughs> okay, bye.